evening to uh, this presentation of, supported by Equipop My Bus. It's really nice to see um, some of our supported riders here, so thank you guys for coming. Um, I'm delighted to introduce Professor Cathy McGowan. Cathy is a professor at the University of Liverpool, so any of you local riders that may have had a horse with colic that can refer to Liverpool, Cathy's <laughs> probably looked after that horse during its uh, course of hospitalisation. Cathy's interests um, started out in equine exercise physiology, um, where you gained a, a PhD. And we asked um, Cathy, she's actually been presenting today to a group of 40 equine vets up at the Castle Marquis, um, talking about some of the new research, talking about the equine athlete, how training is so critical um, because of the job that they do, and how we can help to prevent muscle injuries and help to reduce the risk of muscle injuries. So I asked Cathy if she would also come today, this evening, and present to riders about this topic because it was so informative. So I hope you enjoy the presentation. I'm sure you'll be happy to take questions at the end. That's all right. And um, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Liz. And uh, yes, thanks to the Equitop Maya Plus team for inviting me to speak today. They have been making me work a little bit, but that's okay. Well, that's fine. <laughs> so. Um, before I start though, this picture here, I don't know if you recognise the jump, but um, I have been here before and uh, so if you find yourself in one of the pictures, it, it, I promise you it'll be, in a, it'll be in a nice light, but I did bring my camera last time I was here, so uh, I got some lovely pictures. So yes, I'm going to talk about the equine athlete and <clears throat> just to put us into perspective, I think one of the key um, factors in my talk is going to be to emphasise how different the equine athlete is from ourselves. I think it's quite easy to uh, judge what our horses can do based on what we can do and really um, unfortunately we're rather pathetic creatures compared to our equine counterparts. So if we look at the fastest man alive Usain Bolt, he can uh, run a, a mere 23.5 miles per hour over 100 meters but just an average everyday thoroughbred flat race horse can run 10 times that distance averaging 37 miles an hour an awful lot faster. If we look at our best ultra marathon runners that can run 100 miles and nearly collapse by the end of it, they can average around about six to eight miles per hour. Whereas an endurance horse over the same distance will run nearly twice as fast carrying a rider and they'll certainly pull up a lot better than most of our marathon runners do at the end of the ride. So we certainly, I want to emphasize that the horse is, is a much better athlete. So why is the horse such a great athlete. Well, there's various factors. I'm going to be quite scientific here, but um, I hope you can cope with that. But um, in the blue box here, we've got factors associated with aerobic capacity. And I'm going to focus on that a bit because that's actually what makes the horse a superior performer. Its ability to utilize oxygen to power its exercise. In the red is its anaerobic capacity, which is also very high in the horse. And in the green, is biomechanics and I'll talk about that briefly but the horse obviously has a biomechanical advantage in the fact that it can use stored energy through its tendons and fascia and use that to power locomotion and get a bit more lift than, uh, than we can. So what on earth do these mean, aerobic and anaerobic energy? Uh, most of you will remember this from, from your science, but aerobic energy obviously uses air, uh, air or oxygen. It's a clean energy source, it's a very efficient energy source, but unfortunately it's slow. So when you first, when the animal, or when you first start exercising, you have to rely on anaerobic energy sources. It also has a limit as well, but I'll go into that in a minute. Anaerobic energy is rapidly available, very quick energy source, but it's less efficient. We get the byproduct of lactate, which can of course accumulate, and, um, and that's uh, considered uh, relatively less efficient. And of course, which one you use at any one time depends on the availability of oxygen. So getting that oxygen into the muscles is of vital importance and where the horse performs extremely well. Anytime a horse is actually exercising, it never just only uses aerobic or only uses anaerobic. There's always a mixture of the two. It's not quite as simple as one or the other. And um, I'll show you some information about that in a bit. So, as I've already said, 
The key factor that the, makes the horse quite unique is its, its amazing aerobic capacity. And that can be measured as VO2 max. In Eastern Bloc countries back before the Iron Curtain was removed, they would literally screen school kids. And those with the highest VO2 max were shifted off to be in athletic training um, to be um, athletes. And it's that correlated to performance. And as central to VO2 max is the pathway that the oxygen travels from the air to the working muscle. And that makes sense evolutionarily. Remember our horse, think of the little zebra being chased by a cheetah. Our horse is a prey animal. So it's got to be able to run fast to beat, to, well, at least the little zebra does a few twists and turns, doesn't it? To get away from the cheetah, but it keeps running, whereas the cheetah stops and starts panting because it's a different type of, of uh, metabolism. So if we, it is working okay. So if we compare VO2 max between the species, we can actually do a comparison directly with mils of oxygen utilized per kilo of body mass. So it's quite comparable um, per minute. And we can actually measure this directly. I did that a lot of that during my PhD. A good, a good quality racehorse or elite athlete will have a VO2 max of around about 180 mils per kilo per minute. The highest ever recorded VO2 max in a human has only ever been 90 mils per kilo per minute, and that was in a cross-country skier and quite unusual. Most human athletes would have a VO2 max around 60, elite endurance athletes around about 80, and uh, I won't tell you what mine is. But anyway, sled dogs also have a high VO2 max, but if you think about them, they do you know thousands of, of kilometers or miles of, of exercise um, and are very aerobically orientated. So the pathway of oxygen is central to this VO2 max. So what does that mean? Well many of you will know you've had horses with problems in the past and this is where we as, as vets um, uh, look at these problems. It starts with the nostrils being able to flare properly, all the pathways, your trachea and all the tubules in, in the lungs, the ability of the oxygen to diffuse across the lung into the bloodstream, then the ability for the oxygen to hook onto the blood it obviously has to hook onto haemoglobin, to the red blood cell. That's what makes the red blood cell red. And then it's got to be distributed to the periphery by the heart in the blood vessels. And then it's got to get into these mitochondria here in the muscles. And that's a pathway of oxygen central to exercise in the horse. So how does this horse achieve such a high VO2? Well, it's unique physiology, and particularly with the very large heart. Being Australian, I always like to bring Farlap in as, as the, the example. He was a very famous racehorse quite a long time ago now. And when he died, they measured his heart weight was 6.35 kilos versus the average horse. I mean, a horse's heart is this big when you hold it up. It's, like this, it's not a little tiny heart like we have. Um, and also the horse has this amazing uh, respiration linked to its stride. When a horse is in its suspension phase of a gallop, it has to inspire because when it's going to put its leading forelimb on the ground, it's going to have 150 kilos of, ingest, of, of viscous of its intestines pumping on its diaphragm and it has no choice but to breathe out. So they have this linked breathing and, and, uh, and, uh, and stride. And the other thing a horse does quite effectively for whatever evolutionary sense is it blood dopes itself. Whenever it gets excited, it puts nearly a third, it can put a third of its blood red cell volume back into its um, circulation to increase that oxygen carrying capacity and makes uh, some human athletes who don't play by the rules uh, rather jealous. <laughs> so, horse has a, uh, just again a comparator, there's this amazing um, range of heart rate for the horse. The horse here is in blue. You can see its resting heart rate is much lower than the other species and its exercising heart rate is higher certainly than the human but the range is the greatest of all the species. And again this is this, this um, natural blood doping or this roll of the spleen to contract. A horse has a normal uh, hematocrit or proportion of its blood compared to the fluid in the blood of 40. And then when it gets excited, it doesn't have to run hard to do that, it just have to get excited. You can walk a horse down to the arena and I can assure you, I saw a few horses who were definitely splenically contracted before they exercised. It'll go up to 65, so a, a huge increase in oxygen carrying capacity. Humans are useless, we can't do any of that sort of stuff. And greyhounds can do it a little bit and they do start with a high blood volume anyway, a high red cell volume anyway. So. 
talk, I've said that horses have a good aerobic capacity, but they also have a good anaerobic capacity. But what I want to do is also highlight another difference between horses and humans, which is the relative use of aerobic and anaerobic capacity between a horse and a human. So this um, um, is actually data back from my PhD, where we put a horse on a treadmill, set it to a set speed that was above what it could do based on only oxygen as an energy supply. So it was 115% VO2 max. We set it that, calculated that speed based on an exercise test a week or so before, set it to that speed and said to the horse, ready, steady, go. And it galloped as fast as it could till it got tired, which took 75 seconds. So it's an all out to fatigue test, 75 seconds. So quite an intense exercise test. And you could imagine if that was a human, you'd expect that would be a very anaerobic exercise test because it's quick and it's high intensity, maximum intensity. But in the horse, it's what that exercise test is still 70% aerobic energy sources. And you can see that depicted here. We actually measured the aerobic contribution every few seconds during the exercise bout. And 70% of an all out exercise test around about that time is aerobic energy sources. So even though the horse has a great anaerobic um, capacity, it's predominantly still relying on its aerobic energy to power even high intensity exercise. The anaerobic capacity comes in at the beginning of exercise. Remember I said it was slow, so you need that at the beginning. And also a little bit all the way through because we had high intensity, so it was higher than it could power from oxygen alone. But horses do have a good anaerobic capacity and that can be measured by its lactate production and compared again, comparing our athletic species, the human, um, uh, when a human runs, they will uh, only produce maximal lactates of around 15 millimoles per litre. A horse will produce lactates twice that amount, 30 millimoles per litre and quite comfortably as well. They'll be able to buffer that. They'll do that every time they have a big hit out. Not show, show jumps, so I'll get to that in a bit, what your lactates are. They're not quite that high, fortunately, unless they're having a bad day. Um, but also with lactate, we have to remember how it increases, and this will come on to some things that I talk about later. So lactate builds up in the blood relatively slowly until it reaches a certain point. And it builds up in the blood actually linearly until it reaches this point. It's this magical point of four millimoles per litre. And if there's one thing that is the same across the species, it's this onset of blood lactate accumulation point, which is always four millimoles per litre, whether you're a human athlete, a dog, or, or, a, um, or a horse. And so this um, onset of blood lactate accumulation, so you can see it goes up quite slowly there, and then after that the lactate runs up quite fast. And then uh, when we do submaximal exercise below the onset of blood lactate accumulation, we have a lactate value less than four. When we do more intense exercise, it's somewhere up there, but it can vary quite a lot because it's on a steep part of the curve. And maximal lactate will be around about 30 millimoles per litre. So what do you think the deal is with um, show jumpers? How much lactate do you think they're producing? I've already said it's not quite as high as 30. <laughs> when you do a um, championship level show jumping. Do you know, anybody know? 25. 25. Oh, yeah. Well, it depends. <laughs> you might be going a bit higher than these. For about 150, it's still, as far as energy partitioning is concerned, it's still it's probably less than 20%. This based on some research done on championship level show jumps. They were only jumping about 150 centimetres, so it wasn't as high as some of the jumps. But they produce, at about 150 centimetres, they produce lactates 9 to 10 millimoles per litre. So not 30, but definitely starting to, to be intense there. And heart rates around about 190 to 200 beats per minute. Amateur level show jumping, around about four millimoles per litre. So a bit lower, obviously, the lower the jump, the lower the lactate, basically. And the, it's the jumping effort, of course, it's the anaerobic activity. The, uh, obviously, the rest of it is, is not. There have been higher lactates, high lact very high lactates, of course, are associated with um, you know, high anaerobic capacity. But if you compare horses at the same level, jumping the same height, higher lactates, are, are not ideal and higher lactates have been correlated with increased faults, poorer technique and increased muscle soreness. So, yeah. 
So the other thing that confers the um, a excellent performance in horses is the kinetics of oxygen uptake. Remember I said at the onset of exercise, I turned that horse up on the treadmill and at the beginning I showed you that big anaerobic component. Well, that anaerobic component was big, but it was only for about 20 seconds. To compare that with a human, it'd take about two minutes to get that high of oxygen to the muscles that rapidly. It takes about two minutes for a human compared to, to a horse. Of course, well, that can be improved with training. It can also be improved with warm-up, which I'll tell you a little bit later. And of course, as soon as you um, improve that, you're going to reduce your oxygen debt for, at the end of exercise, faster recoveries, you know, quicker, quicker turning up. So talking about a warm-up, as I've just mentioned, um, it literally is increase in muscle temperature literally increases the rate of all those enzymatic reactions in the muscle that convert oxygen and glucose into ATP, into energy. So uh, it literally has been shown in research that um, for every degree increase in muscle temperature, there's a 13% faster metabolic rate. So it definitely works quite well. And we've shown with research, if you put them on and measure the oxygen and, and um, versus uh, the oxygen, they have a greater aerobic contribution to exercise. Well, of course, because you've shifted away that onset anaerobic component and they have a lower lactate production during exercise. And of course, uh, warm-ups also used for injury prevention. There hasn't been a lot of research that can prove that, even in humans, actually, because they can't get any elite human athletes to not warm up prior to exercise. The only ones they can rope into it in any large studies are, are soldiers in marching exercise. And of course, that's not the sort of exercise that um, is going to induce injury like some sort of high jumper or someone who's uh, really uh, putting a lot of effort in. So I think we, you know, I put a question mark there, but I think it's without doubt that it um, produces a, a injury prevention. So what about training? How can we improve all of these factors? A horse has a great innate ability, but also we want to see what's trainable. What can we do? Three main areas that we're going to want to train. We're going to want to train our strength, speed, acceleration, particularly you guys, the show jumpers, and that's going to be related to our anaerobic capacity and muscle size. But we also remember the dominance of aerobic energy, even in anaerobic energy sources, even in high intensity exercise, we still want to also train our resistance to fatigue, our stamina with our aerobic capacity. And we can train these, I'm going to focus obviously on muscle, um, and we can also change our muscle metabolic properties. And those, and you guys know, um, it's actually again difficult to research, but there's been a little bit coming out now, improved skill. And of course the skill is important. Um, I was actually thinking a, a good example is I've just been teaching my, my daughter how to drive. And it's amazing when you drive, you don't think about it, you put the car on, off you go, and all of these actions that you're doing, try explaining that to a 17-year-old child. It's amazing what they forget. But it's this combination of skills. And of course, it's the same combination, or different combination, but the same principle when you talk about um, jumping a jump or anything else. It's this, the, the body learns to predict or the brain learns to predict and be prepared for the next motion once you learn and train this skill. And that's associated with neuromotor control. Right, so speed, strength and... <laughs> thank you. Uh, speed, strength and, and um, acceleration is associated with anaerobic capacity. As I've already mentioned, it's associated with our muscle fibres, particularly our type 2 muscle fibres. And they're the ones that pack in their large size. They are fast twitch muscle fibres. They have a, a lot of stored glycogen that can be readily broken down for energy. And uh, they have a, obviously a fast twitch which confers this uh, rapid acceleration and taking off. We want to, with our anaerobic capacity, we want to be able to produce lactate and we want to be able to buffer lactate so that we can both produce it and, and handle it um, so that it's ready for exercise. And of course, we get hypertrophy um, with exercise in horses. And there's been quite a bit of research actually over the years. Um, we show that um, unlike humans, actually horses increase in the fiber area of all their fiber types, type one, the, the slow twitch muscle fibers, and the fast twitch muscle fibers all increase in area by around about 30%. And actually show jumping itself um, as a training without necessarily particularly high intensity exercise in between also obviously confers muscle hypertrophy and hopefully you've all seen that in your horses as you train them having a larger muscle bulk 
it does tend to be greater in intense exercise, so greater than 80% of the maximal aerobic capacity. I'll talk about what heart rates they confer to in a bit later. And of course, this confers strength, acceleration, and power output. Now, in some species, not the horse, people worry about increasing the muscle size too much because they worry that the oxygen won't be able to get into the center of that oxygen, into the center of that muscle and power energy production using aerobic sources. We've seen, we've done very high intensity training in horses and have not seen that in horses. They have an amazing ability to produce more blood vessels and, and um, in, around the muscle and actually the diffusional index decreases even with high intensity training. So you don't have to worry about too much muscle hypertrophy. Another thing, of course, with training is, is the resting glycogen. Glycogen's broken down to glucose. All glycogen is a bunch of glucose is joined together, and it gets broken down, and it's used with the oxygen to make the energy. Um, and so, obviously, you've probably heard about human athletes that like to glycogen load before exercise. They have a big carbohydrate meal. They carbohydrate load, and that increases the glycogen in their muscle. You can't do that in horses. The only way to glycogen load a horse is to train it. So I'm sure you're all quite comfortable with that. And in fact, we uh, were doing some, when I was doing my PhD, I was working with a human exercise physiologist who um, was trying to glycogen load horses, particularly post-exercise, to increase the rate of the glycogen replenishment or, or um, glycogen resynthesis. Because that's a really slow process in horses compared to humans. It takes up to three days to get the glycogen re replaced um, um, in the muscle after they've really used a lot. That'll be long exercise bouts. And in fact, he actually induced laminitis in some of these horses because they just couldn't cope with the sugar load, um, induced laminitis, but did not induce a faster rate of glycogen resynthesis um, at all. So you can see here, this is some data from my horses that ignore the overtrained ones, but the ones in red, um, pre-exercise, this is, uh, sorry, pre-training, uh, week one, they had a resting glycogen of 526, and that went well over 600 by 32 weeks of, of training. And that's as high as human muscle will get with the big carbo loading anyway. So they do glycogen load themselves quite effectively. Trained horses also have increased plasma lactate um, at fatigue, so they're able to produce more lactate, but their muscle lactate doesn't get higher. So what that means is they're able to chuck the lactate out of the muscle and buffer it more appropriately. So it allows them to, that's why you can do more intense exercise, jump higher effectively because you've got better lactate transport systems and uh, improved blood buffering capacity. So then we've also got resistance to fatigue or stamina and that's going back to our pathway of oxygen and all the parts of that pathway can improve. Obviously we can't change the oxygen in the air we can't really change the diameter of our nostrils, but um, the horse's heart increases in size. It actually gets more red blood cells in its, in its bloodstream. It's got um, uh, an, a better diffusion capacity and it's able to uh, utilize oxygen better um, after training associated with overall VO2 max in improvement. And similarly, down in the muscle, we get changes as well. Even with high intensity exercise, um, where we get improved ability to utilize oxygen, we get more capillaries, which I've already talked about, that deliver the blood to the right spot. We also get a change in our type two muscle fibers. There's actually two types of type two muscle fibers, our fast twitch fibers. We've got type two A and type two B. The two B have a poor oxid oxidative potential and a type 2A have a very good oxidative potential and we actually get more oxidative fast twitch muscle fibers. And I actually think that's why the horse is such a good performer. They have a very high fast twitch muscle fiber ratio in their whole muscle. They've got about 80 to 90 percent of their muscles are fast twitch but a lot of those fast twitch muscles also perform the job of utilizing oxygen aerobically so that's why they can do both power and stamina at the same time. And they have more mitochondria and more enzymes, of course, as well. This is just showing a photo of muscle um, with a stain that stains some of the mitochondrial enzymes, nice bright blue color, and that blue color increases with training. 
So just to summarize the skeletal muscles uh, that we have in adapt adaptations with training, we get significant muscle hypertrophy as well as the metabolic properties to improve their ability to utilize oxygen. They are predominantly aerobic, but we need our um, higher intensity training to really get that hypertrophy and that power um, as well. The timing, the aerobic changes happen faster than our fiber type switching and our hypertrophy. The hypertrophy takes around about 16 weeks to occur, so about four months of training before you're going to get the, the major changes in fiber, type, in fiber types and fiber area. But we actually trained our horses out to 32 weeks and we didn't get any extra changes at that point. So those of you thinking about your training program, it's that first four months, they're still developing. But after that time, you probably won't get much more hypertrophy and then you just need to obviously maintain that. The duration of exercise also affects who your resting muscle glycogen will, will increase more with longer duration exercise each exercise bout, so more like 45 minutes compared to 25, compared to short, the shorter duration of 25. And also longer duration of exercise maximizes your aerobic uh, improvements as well. So what about uh, improved skill? I've already said the improved skills related to this neuromotor training, training your brain and muscles and nerves to talk to each other in a coordinated fashion so that we can have pre <laughs> prediction of, um, I wouldn't fight that one if I was you. <laughs> it's a bit bigger than you. So they can, you can predict the activity before it happens and I'm sure you've all seen that in the, the show jumpers and, and they're able to uh, to coordinate that action rather than being an uncoordinated uh, jumping attempt. And in fact, um, with exercise testing, we used to always rely on, on heart rate and lactate and, and only just recently now we've realized that um, evaluating jumping technical quality, both the um, rider as well as an observer and the rider's perceived energy level during a jump um, gives additional information if we want to exercise test and performance test horses. But also with skill development, um, we've got various different exercises that we can do um, and uh, very popular these days is, is our dynamic mobilization exercises to improve our proprioceptive training and dynamic stability. Uh, this is Narelle Stubbs, a physiotherapist who did her PhD with me and a rather fat dressage horse of Hilary Clayton's, which we won't talk about how fat it is, but anyway showing some of these um, stabilizing exercises. And these can be really important to increase the functional range of motion, to strengthen the muscles that um, move and stabilize and support the actual, um, particularly the back, but also the peripheral joints during locomotion. It's important to maximize our core stability strength, a bit like Pilates for horses, um, as well as our basic locomotory strength and they're not one and the same thing. They are different muscle groups that do that and it's important as well to improve symmetry and I'll show you some examples of that. So basically when we talk about neuromotor control we're talking about stabilizing muscles. As I said those of you who do Pilates will understand this or at least you will have probably had a go at it anyway improving your own core stability muscles and basically it means if we think about the runner there we think about the knee. When we move we don't we'll have some resistance to movement by the tendons and ligaments and joint capsules, but we also resist excessive movement in that joint by activation of our muscles, and the same obviously with a horse. And if those muscles activate, have to activate at the correct time in order to protect that joint from unwanted motion. And unwanted motion, of course, causes injury, osteoarthritis or other injuries. And it's particularly important in the back and uh, high motion joints in, in the periphery. And we've done some research um, looking at horses. We've shown that um, horses' backs have similar core stabilizing muscles as humans and also similar fiber types. These core stabilizing muscles, remember I said a horse has 80 to 90% fast twitch muscles, fiber types. These are type one muscle fiber types, very different fiber types and um, particularly in those, in those deep areas of, of the back. And we're talking about particularly this lumbar region of, of, of the horse here, but all along the back, we've got these deep core stabilizing muscles and these repeat every single uh, vertebra. 
So this is Narelle um, went on uh, to do some research looking at um, whether or not exercises can improve these core stabilizing muscles and we could actually measure with ultrasound one of them called multifidus and she got some riding horses, did a series of exercises for three months on these horses and showed increased muscle bulk, these specific exercises I'm talking about, and also improved right to left symmetry. And in fact, uh, I talked about the vets this morning, horses have a really high prevalence of low-grade um, lesions in their, in their back, a low-grade bony problems in their back. And uh, these horses, although they had no overt back pain, actually had asymmetry in the, in the muscles stabilizing the back, and this could be improved with these exercises. So what did they do? Seven exercises per day, five days a week for three months, flexion, extension, and lateral uh, movements. And I asked Narelle what would that be equivalent to being relatively ignorant of the physiotherapy side, and she said equivalent to 45 abdominal crunches per day, five days a week. So these are their Pilates. I said I'd mentioned biomechanics. I've only got one slide on this, but um, although it might affect warm up. So biomechanics, the horses um, are able to store the elastic energy in their tendons and also the fascia that connects all their muscles together during exercise, which halves the energy requirement during galloping exercise. And obviously, uh, research hasn't been done in, in show jumpers, but obviously the same sort of thing happens. They're able to harvest the energy. They, their legs literally act like a pogo stick in order to um, power uh, their, their uh, uh, motion. And I guess it's interesting when we think about stretching our performance horses in that um, it's important to make sure that stretching is sport specific. So in our horses that require a lot of powering and spring activity, obviously your show jumpers, and in humans it's been shown that jumping activity, actually stretching, passive stretching, reduces the power output. You can imagine an elastic band and you stretch it, instead of having it nicely primed, it's got a little bit less stress in there. But actually, um, that uh, in horses, because of the high risk of tendon and ligament damage, particularly, I'm sure you're all aware of the issues with horses' tendons, the need for that area to be compliant means that we still need to incorporate stretching into uh, a show jumping horses uh, program. But I probably wouldn't overdo it. We just need to make sure we do that, plus a good warm up. What about swimming? Um, I'm not going to talk too much about swimming, but um, I do th believe that uh, this is two, two different options for swimming. I think you can make up your own mind um, which one you think you would prefer your horse to have. This is Wadham Park in Queensland, Australia. It's, an under it's a horse walker, a water horse walker. And um, apart from the fact that it's got some fairly clever engineering to stop this becoming a tidal wave as it goes around, it's actually a really nice way to give a horse resistance exercise without making them hyperextend their back and uh, uh, actually immersed in the water to that length. And actually there are some, also if you can imagine, particularly for thoroughbreds that, that bleed, um, you can imagine the pressures on that horse's lungs trying to breathe against that water compared to this horse here. So. I'll leave that with you. Right, so just to finish up a few minutes on when things go wrong, I don't know if this um, poor lady is going to injure herself more than the horse. She looks a bit terrified. But anyway, muscle induced, uh, training induced muscle injuries. So there are various problems your horses can inherit, and actually they're quite common, which are tying up problems like RER and PSSM. But I'm not going to talk about those. I'm talking about just overload or traumatic muscle injuries. And horses, as well as humans, can get DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness, muscle strain injury, which can, if it's repeated, can lead to a fibrotic myopathy, and cumulative muscle stress. So delayed onset muscle soreness is usually associated with unusual or unaccustomed exercise. So if I went and did a three peaks challenge, I'm sure I would have DOMS very shortly after that. Or if you guys have had a rest and haven't ridden your horses for a while and get back on, I'm sure you get a bit sore a few days after. It doesn't happen immediately. It happens one to five days afterwards. We've all, we've all heard about that. It's also especially when you use eccentric muscle contraction. So in humans, it's actually when we run down the hill or go down a lot of stairs because it's when the muscle contracts while it's lengthened, okay? Um, I'll talk about the fact that this probably occurs all the time in horses. If you look at their anatomy, I'll show you a picture in a minute. 
And so basically the muscle, um, it can vary. I'm sure you've all had your own personal experience with DOMS from relatively mild degree of muscle pain to really quite severe debilitating pain. And it's associated, if we look at these um, muscles, it's actually human muscle, but um, under electron microscopy, we just get this loss of muscle structure. This is beginning before exercise, immediately after exercise, and three days, uh, 36 hours later, we get this streaming and loss of structure of that muscle, which is associated with elevated muscle enzymes, of course. It has also recently been described in, in racehorses, um, particularly young racehorses being backed for the first time. We did some studies looking at those horses the very first time they had the saddle on. As soon as, the, actually it wasn't the saddle and it wasn't being ridden at trotting exercise. It wasn't until they got up to, I just want to see if I the graph. It wasn't until they got up to cantering exercise and faster that they really showed this, this DOMS, um, whether or not they were more excited then or not, I don't know. And actually, um, DOMS is more likely in fast twitch muscle fibres. So, of course, we've already got horses with a lot of fast twitch muscle fibres. But also, if we look at the horse's stride, we actually have eccentric contractions every gallop stride. And this is a racehorse here. But if we have a look at his <laughs> biceps femoris muscle here, look how lengthened this is. It starts up here on the sacrum, comes all the way down here to the stubble. So it's completely in the lengthened state here. But that horse is about to land on that leg. He has to stabilise that stifle, obviously, or it's otherwise, and then he's got to take off and contract. So he's actually doing an eccentric contraction every gallop stride. And also the other classic eccentric contraction is just prior to taking off jumping. Muscle strain injury can also occur. Um, it's uh, grossly underdiagnosed, but it, it can cause pain in the muscle. Um, it can range from very low grade to quite high grade, um, but it's quite a lot more focal than DOMS. And we've seen that in, in horses. You can pick them up with scintigraphy and ultrasound and various things. And lastly, we can also get elevated muscle enzymes just from overload or, or cumulative uh, load um, in horses. I actually did my PhD on, on overtraining. And if we look at horses over these 32 weeks of training, these are the control horses, we get a creeping up of the muscle enzymes. We get a creeping up, a little bit of cumulative damage over that 32 weeks. If we overload these horses, we look at the black graph here, the black line here, we actually get a, quite a marked increase in these muscle enzymes. So overdoing it, overtraining a horse, sometimes uh, for whatever reason, or even overloading a particular area because it's protecting one area because of lameness or whatever, can certainly cause muscle damage. And actually, we looked at this in some race horses. We actually monitored them over an entire season. And this is the cumulative training days, not the cumulative days, the cumulative actual days of work. And we could see a slow and steady increase in these muscle enzymes. So that's right, why it's important that your horses, as you probably will have all gathered, have a break after a season uh, before you get them back again. So how do we manage uh, muscle activities? The mainstay of prevention of athletic-induced muscle injury is ensuring the horse is fit enough for what it's being asked to do and giving it appropriate rest days to sort of obviously uh, replenish its glycogen, allowing it to recover. Also, of course, I've already mentioned appropriate warm-up, stretching and dynamic stability exercises. Treatment, if you get an injury, involves rest, but also you'd want to improve muscle protein synthesis, um, and that's where we can use our amino acid supplements, particularly branch chain amino acids and essential amino acids, which can improve recovery times and, and help that uh, recovery period. Also, antioxidants like vitamin E can be useful. There's actually not a lot of research that says that um, vitamin E will drop CK levels, but um, it's recommended by our National Research Council to, to feed that. And I think actually horses that damage their muscles use that um, use the antioxidants um, as part of the repair process. And uh, Equitop Myoplast has been used in a, in a study in France where they looked at uh, myoplast in a group of 42 horses and they measured the muscle enzyme activity pre and post an exercise bout and found that horses that have been supplemented for 45 days actually had a lower uh, CK um, accumulation than horses that hadn't been supplemented. So it can help reduce that muscle damage. 
So in conclusion, training the sport horse should include elements of endurance training um, as well as uh, to improve resistance to fatigue um, that will be associated with improved aerobic capacity and muscle aerobic metabolism. As well, uh, they need high intensity training to maximize our improvements in muscle strength, speed and acceleration um, of, uh, to improve muscle size and anaerobic capacity. And skills training is also an important part of sport horse training. Training as well as the appropriate warm-up, stretching and dynamic stability are important for injury prevention and management, including the prevention of athletic-induced muscle injuries. And thank you for your attention. What would you recommend is the best way to do that? <laughs> Without, without working them for like an hour at a time and things on the flat, which is the ideal scenario, but without being Oh, you're saying if it hasn't got the ability to put the time in, okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, there's various tricks that you can do to reduce the load on a horse, one of which was the partial weight bearing in that ho horse walker, the water horse walker. You can also buy underwater treadmills, of course, it's a very expensive uh, undertaking. Um, but heel work can be useful as well. Obviously, be careful with heel work. When I talk about muscle strain injury, I meant to say that you can actually, if they jump too fast up the hill, gallop too fast, they can actually cause muscle strain injury if they're not prepared for it. But you say, for example, the injuries in, in the front legs, heel work can obviously take the pressure off, off the front legs. I've also done work on treadmills. Um, I actually did that 32 weeks of training on treadmills. They, those horses had the best joints after 32 weeks of really high intensity training than I've ever seen. And the, the deal is, the reason why, is the surface is really smooth. There's obviously no lumps or bumps or soft bits on a treadmill. So not that I expect you to buy a treadmill, but make sure your surface is, is as good as it can be. But unfortunately, it's, there's not really many other tricks with that. A quick question about um, these guys are travelling all the time, so the horses are going from show to show, and you were saying that rest days are important. How do you build that into horses that are travelling, and, and what kind of toll does travelling and putting them on, the, on a lorry and having to go for you know, a good number of hours? Mm. Uh, how does that mm -hmm. impact? Well, I'm sure you know better than me, but it depends on the horse, doesn't it? Some horses travel really well and some horses travel awfully and spend the whole time leaning against the side and causing a lot of... I have seen horses with really elevated muscle enzymes just after travelling and that can really can, um, can be a high-intensity um, workload for them. But um, I, think, I think one of the biggest risks of travelling is actually getting the horse out and exercising, particularly if they've got you know, underlying problems. Sometimes you might want them to, to get out. Ideally, you'd turn them out in the field and you obviously can't do that when you're travelling a lot. They've got to be in, in the stable. I don't know really what you can do with that. But I think um, making sure you use the time to get out there in the warm-up arena and loosen them up and make sure they, they get on. I think that's fairly important, particularly, um, particularly with the recurrent myopathies as well. <laughs> Out of interest, does anybody do any of those stretching exercises that we saw pictures of? Because that's the first time that I've I've seen them and really thought about that. Stretching thing. or the dynamic mobilisation? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Scott, you were saying you do? Yeah, yeah we do actually. We uh, something our vet taught us to do, but um, yeah, all you need is a carrot. A few pull moments and uh, <laughs> oh, pullers. <laughs> yeah, we do. Uh, we do a few of those exercises with with, with most of the horses. <laughs> what was telling Elizabeth to write that down? Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Do we have any other questions before? Okay. I'm glad these um, brand ambassadors came. <laughs> um, you were saying before, I can't remember the figures exactly, but after the muscle, was it? Did it when you when it was warm, it was like 13 percent mm -hmm. more. Mm -hmm. How 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 long um, does it take? Would you say for a horse mm. to be ready to jump? You know, to have mm. the maximum. Probably half, maximum warmed up <laughs> oh, if you good like. Oh, question. Yeah, okay. That's actually that's actually a really good question. I didn't. Um, I, I um, dropped this down. Actually, went over anyway. But um, basically, the research that we've done, um, we did five minutes of warm up at 50% VO2 max. Now you might think that's that's fine. I can do that. What does 50% VO2 max mean? 50% VO2 max is 70% heart, heart rate max, which is about 150 beats per minute. And uh, I actually was working with actually one of my physios, uh, Wendy Schaefer, was an uh, event rider, and she said, okay, I'll do that. She said, I'll put the GPS on and I'll watch the heart rate and I'll go. 
And she was screaming around the warm-up arena so fast, all the other competitors thought she was completely mad. So, yes, <laughs> five minutes is enough if you can get intense enough, but um, a bit longer. But to be fair, five minutes was all, and we literally measured a much greater yeah. oxygen. So, yeah. so that's an interesting point, because how many of you, like, you know, I, I watch a lot of, of warm-ups, and a canter seems to be slower, a lot slower in the warm-up than you would use in the arena. Especially but at least you're jumping, though, yeah. so that so would help. Does that, yeah. does that impact on the, the speed of warm-ups? Yeah. I would actually add in some, uh, I think I've watched your warm-up and, and uh, a couple of, not the high necessarily jumping, but a couple of jumping efforts during the warm-up would increase your intensity because you're not going to get fast enough when you're doing a nice, beautiful, collected canter, which you see everybody. That's going to, your horses are going to have a heart rate of about 110. You know, they're not going to be very high at all. And some of them lower than that, probably about 90. <laughs> Does anybody measure their heart rate while they exercise? Their horse's heart rate, not theirs. <laughs> Yours would be a bit higher. <laughs> yeah. But um, that, that lovely, you know, beautiful canter that's uh, all very relaxed, they're not going to have a very high heart rate. But said so putting jumping efforts into it will make a difference. Any other questions? It is actually warmth as well, though. Well, it's like the question genius. <laughs> <laughs> and um, what do you think the uh, significance is of warming down after jumping? Oh, good after question. Jumping? I had a slide on that too. That's a good idea. This is great. <laughs> Uh, warming down is actually really important. Um, I was going to say with the warming up though, is actually being warm. So once they've warmed up, you've got to keep them warm. So obviously put the blankets on. I've, you, know, you, you probably do that anyway. Warming down is really important. So when the lactate accumulates, it actually gets reuptaken into muscles, working muscles, a lot of it, as well as red blood cells in the liver and other places. It's actually been shown with research that the lactate gets taken up faster if the horse is actually trotting rather than walking in the warm down period. So it's actually, um, depends, I mean, you might not, it depends on how hard, but if it's a particularly hard hit out, you're better off keeping your horse jogging than you are to walk it really slowly and sort of stop it completely. How long? How long? Mm, I don't know, really. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I prob no, no, actually, I think with John Thornton's study, I think it was 10 minutes actually trotting was the study that was done, yeah. So keep them trotting. Was that study done on Avengers? No, it was done on racehorses. They would have had a lot higher so lactates, lactates. Yeah, well, to be fair, yeah, you will be producing less lactates, hopefully, <laughs> than a thoroughbred racehorse. Yeah, so, yeah, to I'd drop it down. I still think five minutes trotting would be quite reasonable. I think five minutes, I wouldn't even go less than five. It's not much exercise for a horse to do five minute trot. Not going to tire him out. <laughs> Does, uh, does the questioning genius have any, any more, <laughs> or are we, uh, are we done? <laughs> the brain cells are done. Yeah. Uh, well, all that remains is for me to uh, thank Cathy very much again for um, a great presentation. I hope you found it useful. And um, if you're around this evening anyway with us, we'll be in the champagne bar from seven if you have any other questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks.